Good evening, and welcome to the second in our series of three gatherings together as we look at the emerging development of, of religious faith. Now, our emphasis this evening shifts toward transcendence and the place of humanity as we develop a new awareness of our morality and our, our mortality. Several of you have asked about a bibliography, and as you came in, you were handed a sheet of paper that has a very nice bibliography on the back. Michael is delighted that you want to read. <laughs> also, if you would like to have, we are taping these sessions, and if you would like to have contact to get a tape copy, please put your email address on the response form that you have so that we can contact you with them when they come. Make sense? If you want a copy, put give us your email so we can contact you. Michael, last week you challenged us to think and you helped us do it. You provided some information that some of us don't have access to. And the size of our crowd this evening is a way of saying, thank you, thank you. We're e eager this evening to hear you build on what you started last week. We're delighted to have you back. We welcome you here. It's all yours. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, it's really, really uh, my delight to be here. And it's my delight to, uh, to acknowledge that this is uh, um, Chautauqua Wawasi on the road uh, uh, here in Greencroft. And so we want to say thanks to Mark and to John and to Dave and the folks from Chautauqua Wawasi for sponsoring uh, this particular series as part of their faith series. But also they do things all throughout the year. So I know that you have brochures or a flyer or something in the back that you probably were given on the way in. Make sure that you uh, take a close look and put those events on your calendars as well. Uh, we also want to say thanks to uh, uh, John and uh, Glenn, the uh, technical gurus uh, for the evening uh, here. And we want to say uh, thanks to uh, um, uh, uh, my good buddy, uh, Don Blosser. And uh, uh, Don, where'd you disappear to? Uh, oh, there you are in the back. And your beloved bride, Carolyn, who's here tonight. And it's a delight to see Carolyn as well. Uh, I was given... Uh, um, this by John uh, Dave Barry and John Beams and Don and Carl Shelley and Julia Gingrich and John Hartzler Tech John Hartzler on the tech and they were part of the steering they were the steering committee for this evening's event so make sure uh, that you say thank you to them because I applaud them for all their planning and their efforts for the evening thanks John for that appreciate it so last week, so let, let's let's get into this uh, tonight. Um, last week, we asked the question, if texts didn't appear until around uh, four and a half millennia ago, around 2600 BCE, and the biblical creation myths in Genesis weren't written until about 1000 to 600 BCE, then what did religion or the religious impulse look like before then? We discussed prehistoric proto-religion, 50,000 to 12,000 BCE, early stages of symbolic thinking and representation. Remember, I always found this interesting when I first learned this a couple of decades ago, art and religion arise at the same time in uh, human evolution as signs of human culture. And in this period of 50,000, 12,000 BCE, we learn that woman, with a capital W, woman beyond all dualities, was the primary symbol represented by women figurines and by the cave as womb. Her walls engraved with shamans, uh, ancient uh, bestiaries, and the hunt. That was last week. Well, 
over the next 10 millennia, climate change, migration, settlements, economic and technological advances, building programs, they all cause an explosion of human self-understanding. Because of migration, human beings evolved at different rates and different cultures around the world. And even though there are other vibrant cultures uh, and traditions, I'll be focusing tonight on Southern Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, as they provide the foundations uh, for the world's majority faiths. At the end of the last ice age, it lasted from about 110,000 BCE to 12,000 BCE. The world's population was about 3 million. Succeeding generations of hunter-gatherers remembered stories from their elders about how they were able to leave the caves after the Ice Age was over, observing a great variety and number of animals grazing on the grasslands. And they wonder, and they wonder, how can we make sure this land of plenty remains? By 8,000 BCE, World population has doubled to 6 million, settlements grow, and in the next 4,000 years, increased agriculture. Fishing moved from the shore to boats. Domestication of dogs and ox and cattle continued. Goats and horses now were bred. Sumerians invented uh, the wheel, profoundly changing agriculture, transportation, and warfare, settlements, farming, dwellings, dwellings for their personal use, of course, but also for communion with their deities, initiation, burial, uh, uh, equinox and solstice and harvest and planting uh, rites were observed. They evolved into sanctuaries, these uh, structures, sanctuaries for pilgrims they were the let's think of them as the ancient uh, ancestors of the temple in jerusalem or the kaaba in mecca and the people who would come the pilgrims who would come would bring their wild grains to share and to sacrifice and they drop along the way and they would grow and eventually they became domesticated too by 3500 bce Global population had exploded to 100 million, and division of labor in each settlement occurred, raising, distributing, accounting for food. Merchants and craftspersons and political leaders and religious leaders and priests uh, arose to perform uh, religious rituals. By 1000 BCE, Urbanization, and we're going to come back to that again and again and again. Urbanization increased. Now with kings and emperors, pharaohs, empires and dynasties, trade between the states, cross-pollination of ideas as people moved around, the beginning of the Iron Age, impacting agriculture, the hunt, and warfare. I mean, just think about it. You all know your Old Testaments, the Philistines who came from Crete, brought with them uh, iron, uh, 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 iron weapons, armor, axles for their chariots, etc. That's why they were such fierce warriors uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible. Riding was invented in Mesopotamia and Egypt in 3200 BCE, India 2600, China 1200, and was widespread by 600 BCE, the end of the Iron Age. <clears throat> think of, just think about this for a minute. This change that took place in the human psyche, that settling in one place must have caused. We know this too from the Hebrew Bible, don't we? Abraham usually is dated around 1800 BCE. A wandering Aramean was my father, the Jews say about Father Abraham, 
who brought with him, who brought with him from the Ur of the Chaldees to what became known as the promised land, right? Portable deities, gods and goddesses. And then not only 800 years later, the time of the kings, and now the kings in each one of the kingdoms around the Middle East had their own single gods, each one used to unify their kingdoms. These portable gods, and 800 years later, now stationary, one god for each one of the kingdoms. Think about just the, the, the psychocultural evolution, well, uh, uh, what psycho, psychological anthropologists call it, that took place. Imagining a multi-layered universe now, supernatural worlds above and below inhabited by gods and angels and demons symbolized in sacred relics, rituals, and dance, and shared in common by everyone in a particular community. This shift that takes place is amazing during this time. So let's summarize this period and then we'll move on. Out of caves and settled. Sanctuaries are built now as ritual spaces for communion with heavenly gods. And as these were sacred structures, no other construction was allowed nearby, inhabited only by priests, male priests, the only worthy intermediaries with the gods. And this resulted in their high social status and political power. And in the late Neolithic period, this was especially true. They were in four, and, and, and here's the point. Theologies and scripture, theologies developed and script, scriptures were written to reinforce and to legitimize and to justify the position of these male priests. The concept of sacrifice also changed. In the old rites, yeah, here we go. In the old rites, uh, uh, Karen Armstrong says, the sacrificer passed the guilt of the animal's death on to others. But now, by symbolically becoming one with the sacrificed animal, the priest took its death into his own being. And by offering himself to the gods, he believed that, like the animal, he would experience immortality. Play that out in your mind and see how that would evolve in the centuries and millennia to follow. So now let's talk about the axial age, which is really where I want to spend the majority of tonight. There are certain periods in history when uh, in retrospect, you know, in hindsight, we can we can discern great advancements. Uh, what what the sociologist Robert Bella calls a spiritual quantum leap in our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. Paradigm shifts in consciousness. Such was the period in the first millennium BCE, especially 800 to 200 BCE. German Swiss psychiatrist, philosopher Karl Jaspers coins the term the axial age for this period. He observed strikingly parallel new ways of thinking across the known world, occurring independently and simultaneously. Of e- with each other. India, China, the Middle East, and Greece, and seminal thinkers in each one. He has his critics, uh, by the way. For example, he glosses over uh, some differences, and he ignores other axial centers, and, and they're, they're, they're important axial centers like pre-Christian Celtic Britain, or Akhenaten's monotheistic Egypt. He glosses over those. But uh, uh, the Axial Age is still universally uh, accepted as an important paradigm in the development of religion in this period. 
agricultural surpluses, technological advancements, trade between states, and subsequent exchange of ideas produce societies with broader perspectives and worldviews than that which came before. All the great world's religion, tr religious traditions came into being or, or their seeds were sown in the first millennium BCE. So let's take a look at each one. India and liberation. And I'll just remind you, the ones that I'm about to uh, uh, catalog for you, all between 800 and 200 BCE. Hinduism. In India, uh, during this time, there was great economic corruption and political upheaval, where powerful kingdoms were created by force. Into this chaos, the Vedas and the Upanishads taught Dharma, the universal moral law that's foundational to family and society. When you are aligned with your Dharma, when you do your Dharma, your, your, your duty in family and society, you achieve liberation, moksha. Liberation from karma and illusion, from fear and desire, and realize your deepest, truest self. They say Atman equals Brahman or Tattva Masi. You are that. Buddhism. Dharma is developed even further. When Siddhartha Gautama, born to a high caste family, renounced his privilege and committed himself to the ascetic life, he offered an alternate an alternative to the caste system by following his dharma, which he called the Four Noble Truths, the reality, causation, and cessation of desire. Letting go, detachment. The prescription is the Noble Eightfold Path, the vehicle for erasing the ego and achieving uh, enlightenment. Someone asked the, uh, 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 the Buddha one time, what are you? Not who are you, but what are you? He said, I am awake. Awake. <laughs> A plus. He himself achieved enlightenment around the age of 29 to 30 and became Buddha. Jainism, the last of 24 spiritual teacher saviors, Varthamana, Jainism's founder, a contemporary of Buddha, became Mahavira, which means the great hero, at the age of 43. Jainism teaches all living things, including animal life and plant life. Each have souls, and each one possessing a spark of the divine. Its central principle, therefore, is ahimsa, non-harm, non-harm to all living things, as a way of purifying and liberating the soul. Gandhi's mother was a giant. India and liberation. China and harmony. <laughs> Confucianism. During this period, China was engaged in a series of wars between states. Confucius was a failed politician who left his home state after his ruler rejected his reforms. He left in exile, self-imposed exile, and then returned to advise officials about the old virtues about proper social relationships, personal and governmental uh, uh, responsibility and morality, and the importance of order and unity. He summarized his teaching with something you may have heard. Do 
do not do unto others as you would uh, not have them do unto you. Years after he died, his teachings were collected in the Analects. Taoism. Taoism, attributed to the mythical uh, Lao Tzu, stresses living in harmony with the Tao, which is the source and energy of all that exists, holding the two opposing forces in nature in yourself, the yin and the yang, holding them in creative tension because both are true, both are real, both have power, but they have the most power of all in creative tension. If you get out of balance, well, you know yourselves, right? If you get out of balance, well, uh, you really feel it. There's something off inside of your energies in your body. Living a life aligned with nature, simplicity, humility, wu-wei, defined as effortless action or effortless creativity or effortless dynamism. These teachings are written down in my favorite scripture, uh, the Tao Te Ching. So, India and liberation, China and harmony. Greek rationalism. The 5th century BCE in Greece saw the height of Greek tragedy, their way of capturing artistically the tragic effects of uh, the time of great violence, human suffering as a catalyst for spiritual and personal growth. Greek religion, for example, a Homer's epic Iliad and Odyssey, uh, uh, describe the exploits of gods and goddesses and heroes. There also appeared at this time rational speculation and philosophy. How do you, the question, how do you educate in virtue for the ideal citizen? The answer, paideia. The Latin translation is humanitas, the beginning of what you know in the university as the humanities. That's how you educate people in virtue, the humanities. And of course, we know that's true because all of our school boards and, and boards of education are supporting that kind of view around the country. <clears throat> I try, you know, I, I shouldn't say those things, but I guess I should. Um, Parmenides and uh, Heraclitus, the two schools, the, 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 the schools of these two fellows had, had disputes over the nature of reality. Is reality ever changing or is it ever static? Parmenides develops the philosophy of being. Uh, Heraclitus, the philosophy of becoming. Parmenides, reality is one, timeless, and the world in which we live is illusion. Heraclitus, reality is ever-changing. He's the one who said, you can't step into the same river twice. And he develops the idea of the logos, universal reason, the eternal source of all that is, that, as you know, uh, uh, six centuries later, the Apostle John develops and talks about Jesus as the divine logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And the logos became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And Democritus, the father of modern science, taught that all matter is composed of atoms with spaces in between. Later, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle create systems of philosophy containing ethics and politics and metaphysics, the foundation of Western thought, including religion. 
And 300 BCE, Zeno of Sidium founds Stoicism, which itself had a profound effect on Christian thought. Its central question was, how do you live the fulfilled life? How do you live a life of happiness, eudaimonia? <clears throat> eudaimonia, uh, uh, there are treatises and treatises and treatises written about eudaimonia uh, in, in uh, the centuries BCE. How do you live the virtuous life? The answer, Zeno says, you live in harmony with the Logos, with divine reason. And again, that gets developed later on again in schools of Christian philosophy uh, and, and after the time of Jesus in the early church. So India and liberation, China and harmony, Greek rationalism. The Middle East, monotheism and history. Zoroastrianism. In Iran, Zoroaster, we, we uh, uh, thus spake Zarathustra, right, for Nietzsche, received a vision that there was only one supreme good God contrasted with the old polytheistic faith. And this one supreme God did not require sacrifices anymore, no more blood sacrifices, but only ethical behavior. Each person locked, locked in a struggle between good and evil in a universe ruled by this one supreme good God. His image of the final judgment where the wicked would be consumed by fire had a major impact on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Zoroastrianism uh, became the national religion of Persia, uh, ancient Iran. Fourteen hundred miles to the west, reacting to the corruption and fall of both the northern and southern kingdoms in ancient Israel, the destruction of David's temple in Jerusalem, the Babylonian exile and return, an absolute ethical monotheism developed. So during this time, you have the Hebrew prophets. Uh, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Amos, and others. And what do they what do they preach? They emphasize right behavior over right belief and ritual as proper obedience to the one God. <clears throat> Examples: Amos, I hate your festivals. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Micah, what does the Lord require? to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. And of course, uh, the great suffering servant songs in Isaiah 52 and 53. I'll let you read it. And so just a few centuries later, the followers of Jesus, an itinerant, a uh, Palestinian uh, Jewish rabbi identified him as the incarnation, the embodiment of this one God, and so Christianity was born. Six centuries later, Prophet Muhammad preached the religion of Abraham, Moses, and Jesus to the people of Arabia and submission, Islam, to this one God which in short order spread like wildfire throughout the Middle East and beyond. Now here's the point. These monotheistic axial faiths are also called religions of history. Why? For example, in India and China and other Eastern faiths, but in India and China, let's say, it doesn't matter if Buddha or Lao Tzu did or did not exist for their teachings to be true. But in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, their God 
acts in history and historical action is required of their believers. For these three faiths, history matters. So, Indian liberation, China in harmony, Greek rationalism, and the Middle East monotheism and history. So what can we learn from all this? I'll just, I'll just remind us again, all of this happened between 800 and 200 BCE. Wow. Which begs the question, then, what can we learn from this revolutionary period in human history? This spiritual quantum leap forward in our consciousness. And what do they have in common? There had been a few early Neolithic cities, for example, Jericho in Palestine. I, I've been in Jericho maybe two dozen times. I'll be there again in June. Yet with increased urbanization from 3000 BC on, you have fully thriving cities like Damascus and Luxor, Nineveh and Babylon, Haojiang in China and others. Power shifts from the priest and the king from the temple and the palace, it shifts from those places to the marketplace. And social inequality and exploitation become more pronounced with increased urbanization. States war over land and seek political and economic supremacy. In each one of these axial faiths, the spiritual advance took place in the context of chaos and violence. Think about that. Our religions were created in the context, in response to context of chaos and violence. Still near the beginning of the Iron Age, iron weaponry was created making wars more lethal and deadly. Karen Armstrong. <clears throat> in every single case, the spiritualities that emerged during the Axial Age began with a recoil from violence. Looking into the heart to find the sources of violence in the human psyche. It, dro it drove people inward. The conviction that the world was awry was fundamental to these spiritualities. All the great sages were living in a time like our own, a time of fear, violence, and horror. Their experience of impotence in a cruel world impelled them to seek the highest goals and absolute reality in the depths of their being. No longer up, but now in. It's a sad and terrible fact. I skipped. Let me go back. Because writing is not a sad and terrible fact. Writing develops during the Neo. We'll get to that in the next slide. Writing develops during the Neolithic age, and impacts the development of religion. That uh, the sociologist Robert Bella says, the development of writing directly related to the establishment of empires and huge centralized societies entailed the need for the literate elites to educate and train new generations of scribes, and eventually editing books, hence holy texts. Religion inscribed in a book became a portable religion, one that could and did travel. Think about the impact on the development of religion when you have your central teachings that now can travel. Now the sad and terrible fact that the subservient role of women was codified during the Axial Age. Even when the founders of these religions preached equality, each Axial religion remained fundamentally male-centered. The hierarchical structure inherited from the Neolithic period eventually evolved 
roles of king, emperor, pharaoh, considered in some societies as divine incarnations, or in others, when there was a division of roles, these male kings and priests uh, were the primary mediators of the people to the god, a primarily male priestly class. And it's a sad truth, too, that the more settled the communities became, goddess imagery and the role of women uh, were diminished. Male priests projected, represented a male deity and developed, as I said earlier, theologies and scriptures to reinforce that. And, you know, I mean, let's face it, we're still to this very day trying to break free from this assault. And it's nothing less than an assault on women. Increased symbolic thinking, long-term memory, the development of the brain, the neocortex in the brain, thinking about the future are just a few of the major developments observed by cognitive and behavioral scientists in this period. From the journal Communicative and Integrative Biology, these are some of the uh, uh, behaviors that developed. Cooperative behaviors, which can be seen in religious concerns for compassion and charity. Sexual behaviors, visible in religious concerns for chastity and imposed monom monogamy. Economic behaviors, condemnation of greed and conspicuous consumption. Parenting behaviors, increased involvement with children. All this taking place in this rich period of time. In many ways, the axial age is the beginning of humanity uh, as we know it. Human beings become conscious of their own nature and begin to ask questions about what it means to be human. Karen Armstrong again. People who participated in this great transformation, which is the title of her book, were convinced that they were on the brink of a new era and that nothing would ever be the same again. They saw change in the deepest reaches of their beings, looked for greater inwardness in their spiritual lives, and tried to become one with a transcendent reality the first time in human history. <clears throat> Increased urbanization led to what psychological anthropologists call a crisis of individuation and three sub-crises, a crisis of morality, meaning, and mortality. These urban centers, remember, these, these, these urban centers now that had been created were diverse, no longer tribes or clans bonded by blood with a shared culture, traditions, and narratives. No, you now lived and worked and worshipped among people from many tribes with different cultures and traditions and stories to tell, even different deities. No longer did you find your identity as a member of the tribe, you were now your own unique self. And so the question arises, who were you? The answers to your questions no longer, I'll say, no longer found in the tribe, but within your own heart for the sources of violence, desire, joy, and the dreams you experienced. Your own emotional, psychological life became the subject of your reflection. In other words, you became an I. Crisis of individuation, which then in turn led to a crisis of morality. There were no longer shared norms nor long-standing tribal traditions. But now individuals and societies had to negotiate different value systems and codes of right and wrong. 
They had to, to codify the laws that would govern them. What would be the limits to this newly found individual freedom? This great and wonderful sense of individual freedom that also caused anxiety and you'd rub up against others' freedoms as well. Religion, too, is impacted. Not sacrifice anymore. Not tribal identity. No longer shamans. But now focused on ethics and the highest virtues. Compassion. Empathy in the face of violence. And individual rights. Individual rights. Crisis of meaning. Tribal gods were replaced by universal gods. We, we touched on this last week. They're universal gods. Well, at least each group believed their god was the universal one, right? <laughs> right? Um, uh, for most, the only true one. Questions arose about individual meaning and identity and personhood, the purpose of life, personal ethics the origin and aim of the world and what binds us together as human beings. Who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I heading? What's it all mean, Alfie? Religion becomes inward looking. What does it mean to be human? I mean, truly human. Fully human. What does it mean? And this crisis of individuation, morality, meaning crisis of mortality. Think about it this way. In pre-axial tribes, when you died, even after you died, you remained in the tribe, with the tribe, you simply existed on a different plane of exist, a different plane of existence. The ancestors were still present, right? The ancestors were ever present forces and energies who the tribe venerated and sought out and petitioned for guidance and healing and the hunt and the harvest and all the rest. Graves of the ancestors were tended as memorials not to their absence, but to their presence. Now, no longer, now, with this increased urbanization and individuation, no longer these individuals are part of the tribal fabric. Now, an I dies, a unique self dies. You die. And people had to answer the question what happens to my? self what happens to me what happens to their i and so in response during this period of time philosophies and theologies of the soul and reincarnation and resurrections and immortality projects begin to be formulated by these various religious traditions in response to their I no longer being. Well, I'm wrapping up here. So in these last two weeks, tonight and last week, we've seen the following evolution take place in religion. The nature religions in the Upper Paleolithic period, 50,000 to 12,000, Neolithic religion, 12,000 to 2,000, and tonight then the axial faiths, 800 to 200, India, China, Greece, and the Middle East. Think of it this way. Tribal consciousness, and now, and now, during the axial period, the first axial age. Now tribal consciousness evolves into individual consciousness. But what we're going to learn about next week, and I'll just say it now, as a bridge, 
I'll come back to the previous slide, as a bridge to next week, following the late Fordham University pres prof uh, theology professor, Ewart Cousins, he argued that since the Enlightenment and the rise of modernity, industrialization, secularization, and all the rest, we've entered into a second axial age or a second axial awakening, a second great transformation of human consciousness, an evolution into a global earth-centered embodied uh, uh, consciousness. And so what we're going to talk about next time is how individual consciousness, at least that's where we're going to begin next time, how individual consciousness because we're in the middle of now the second axial awakening transfers, evolves into now a global, earth-centered, embodied consciousness. This new global consciousness sees the dangers and threats of an overemphasis on individualism and otherworldly concerns, focusing now on the diversity and interconnectedness of all humanity, as well as on social justice, and as our Jewish friends talk about, tikkun olam, healing the planet. And we'll take that as our starting point next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
We're living that today in many legislatures around the United States and even in our court systems, you know, and um, there's something about, there's something about uh, woman's sexuality that we find fearful and need to control, need to dominate. And so it's not just, you know, with our ancestors, but we still find we still find it happening in our world today, and it, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I'm I'm just basically agreeing with you. Uh, in Harari's book on sapiens, he talks a lot about the significance of becoming agricultural, and I'm wondering if the agriculture shift had anything bearing on the development of religion? That's the one question. The other one is, when I was teaching a special class for high school students, they came and said, oh, so you're a Christian. You have a sacred book called the Bible, right? Right. Jews have a sacred book called, you know, the, the Torah. And Islam has a sacred book. And you're all monotheistic believers. You all have the one God. Now tell me, sir, which one has the truth? So if you answer that, and then along with this Harari question, I'll be happy camper. I'll, I'll need at least a minute and a half to do that. <laughs> um, well, agriculture is a game changer, right? The domestication of animals and of uh, uh, grains, right? Wheat, corn, uh, et cetera. Um, because it allows us, it allows our ancestors to become settled, and then everything flows from that. I mean, we kind of made that case tonight, right? So everything flows from that: <clears throat> the rise of the pre male priestly class, the rise of kings and emperors, and all the rest. They become representatives or mediators to this, or they project these male deities. I mean, you know, it it all flows from this development of, uh, uh, of agriculture. So, uh, amen, amen. You know, you're asking you're asking the question that uh, we're going to tackle next week a little bit about this. Um, you know, what do you do with the uh, when when faiths intersect? I was going to say collide, but I mean they can collide. But when faiths intersect, and and uh, I was one of the founders of the St. Louis World Religions Dialogue when I lived there, and one of the founders of Confluence. The religious dialogue in Fort Wayne. And after 9-11 happened, Mayor Richard called a, a dozen of us together, and it was the Mayor's Commission on Interfaith Understanding, and I was a part of that. How do you, you, you ask the right question, how do you bear witness to the truth while recognizing truths? Religions have been really terrible at answering that question. But so have secular philosophies too. What is it about us that needs to that needs to what is it psychologically? I and mean, this is why the psychology of religion is such an important discipline. What is it about us that that needs to shift from bearing witness to, to truth, to exclusive claims of truth. They're not the same. So there's something, there's something in, in the human psyche, there's something that we get out of it. There's something that satisfies us, that makes that shift, that we have to fight against within ourselves. But we, we, you know, we're, not, we're not instinctual being, we're not animal. I mean, we can make those choices. Right, we can make those choices if we choose to. We'll talk about it more next week, but that's that's the that's sort of the first answer. But that's why that's why I'm going to make the case next time. Uh, so y'all come um, that uh, um, Hans Kung, the you know great renegade Catholic theologian who was who was banned by uh, was it Benedict or 
John Paul. Uh, but uh, uh, Hans Kung says that if you try to deal with each other on with truth claims, it's a losing proposition. He says religions, religions can be a force for the good in the world today if they if they um, if they move toward adopting and asking secular people as well, non-religious people, to adopt not a central truth claim, but what he calls a global ethic. And and uh, the medical field can be uh, help with this, right? First, do no harm. And we'll talk next week too about, so that's Hans Kung, talk next week too about how Karen Armstrong talks about her compassion initiative built around the golden rule. So those kind of things lie in our futures. Uh, if we're going to, if, if we're going to uh, be nice to each other, live together, but also uh, save the planet. But that's coming attractions. <laughs> Excuse me. As I, as I watched the, tr or listen to the trajectory of last week and this week and this, big story that you tell i'm my mind keeps going to what i'm learning about indigenous people who yeah. are in many respects left out of this story and yet biologically are evolving as those who come from the eurasian uh trajectory have done and i just wonder if uh you'd speak to us some about um, it seems that there's a, a renewal and a, a globally among indigenous people that are posing the proposition of indi indigenization as part of the answer to this uh, the uh, the lost quality of these great empires and these great religions that get tied to these great empires. They see us as lost people, not people evolving into greatness so much. So um, I, I just wonder if you could find a, a help sure. us to include a recognition yeah. of of those peoples into this story. Yeah, thanks for that, John. <clears throat> that's that's just one of the weaknesses of my presentation these three weeks. That in this trajectory, this this ten thousand foot view that I'm I'm painting, that there's whole peoples, whole cultures, whole traditions that you know are being ignored. So that's the first thing. Um, invite me back. Uh, that that would that would be a wonderful series uh, uh, for, for down the road. Second, the best, and I should have included this in the bibliography. The best book, I mean, it's one of the best books I've read in the last ten years. He's a he's a National Geogra Ge Geographic explorer. His name is Wade Davis, and um, he writes a book called The Wayfinders. And you can find him on YouTube. He does these wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 interviews or talks. But it's it's a it's it's a little book. Very, but he takes various indigenous peoples that he's visited, and spent time with. I mean, lived with, lived with, and he talks about how in the West we've viewed them as primitive. But their way of life, their insights into the world, especially their insights into the earth as a living, breathing, sacred partner in this experiment we call life. Um, so that's, I mean, for me, and you know much more about uh, indigenous folks than I do, John. Uh, but uh, for me, it's it's this relational, th this relational uh, 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 arc that they experience with the earth. 
that the earth is a partner, not something to be subjugated or dominated. But um, and when I say the earth, I mean not only uh, uh, animal life and but but plant life, the cosmos. As uh, this great, uh, well, as I mentioned last week, Sally McFaig, and she's in the bio, she's in bibliography. This Christian theologian, the body of God, she calls it. She's a Westerner, but uh, um, yeah, the earth is partner as lover, even. I I'll say a little bit more about it next week, but that's what I have to say now. But Wade Davis, the Wayfinder, you know, Wade, you know, it's it's one of the best books I've read. Robin Kimmerer as well. Yeah. Braiding sweet grass. Yes, sir. In fact, you know who recommended that book to me? John Beams. Over lunch a few years ago, John's the one who introduced uh, Robin Kimmerer to me. Could, could we just borrow that microphone very quickly and Don will return it right to you. Please make that plug, okay? Sorry. Apologies. Thank you. Uh, Chautauqua Wallace is going to host two <laughs> American elders um, from the Miami tradition um, over at Syracuse at the WACF place. It's a beautiful place. Um, just the week after Labor Day. It's on our material back there. If you're interested in this, and maybe you could come up and do some dialogue with They're them too. Wonderful, two wonderful women who will be speaking about story, the power of story and tradition. It'll be a wonderful program. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to talk about, uh, thanks, John and Beth. We're going to talk about story next week and the power of story. Because really, I mean, that's what this is, right? I mean, we're 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 dealing with, we're dealing with what stories do we tell ourselves and, and about our deepest our deepest values? You know, everything everything is a symbol. Everything is is a metaphor. I'm going to say this next week, but even even the word God, you know, I can say G O when I say the word God, it's not God. The word God isn't God, right? The word God is has within it a whole set, a whole panoply of emotions, meanings images and i might say i might they might mean something to me when i say the word but when you hear it it might mean something completely different to you but god even as symbol and metaphor of a, a whole experience you know i heard a native american who has her doctorate in our scientific uh, understandings said that what she was taught there is like seeing the visual part that we can see. And in light, there's a whole spectrum. And this includes religious and all kinds of other things beyond what we can only see with our limited focus. And uh, I thought, what do you think of that idea that Actually, good science is seeking truth, and it's much broader than our simple focus. Well, I really appreciate that. You know, uh, this has been <clears throat> this has been uh, discussed for millennia. Karen Armstrong has sort of made a cottage industry out of it in our day, but the the the, the relationship between what she calls what the Greeks called mythos and logos, logos reason, science, the quest for knowledge through sensory perception of the universe, you know? Mythos, the quest for meaning. I often tell my students, you know, I, I wouldn't want a, a poet doing heart surgery on me, you know? And likewise, I wouldn't want uh, 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 a, a mechanic or uh, uh, a physician you know, necessarily with their scientific knowledge, 
trying to explain the meaning of the universe. Each one has their proper place and the proper relationship between the two, mythos and logos, the quest for meaning and what we can, what we can tell through our senses, what we can experience through our senses and learn about the universe and ourselves through our sens sensory perceptions. Both of those together give us a glimpse of reality. Give us, and, and, it's, and it's a glimpse because we're still on the road, right? We're still on the road. Hi. Hi. Um, your topic was defined as being the roots of religion, of our of, of our current religions. And I realize I should take your course and say it's, it's a <laughs> no, 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 question. Please. But I would, you know, you you sort of did a flyover, but making links to current thinking that have been thought long ago. And I would love to hear more about that. Could, could you could you say just a little bit more? Uh well, I'm not, I was, quite, I'm not quite sure. I, of I was thinking, for example, you were making the point that it's some, and I've forgotten which religion it was, but um, the notion that everything is constant and does not change. It sounds like Plato versus, you know, and the, these thoughts are long ago, and, and yet we incorporate some of those into our current religious thought. No, That's, ab absolutely. Yeah, and so it would be interesting to go back to some of those and say, oh, that's that. That's you know. That's where that began, or seems to have begun. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think about the best way. That's a. I, I think I'm. I think I'm starting to understand what the question is. Um, can. I'm trying to uh, think about where that might uh, uh, be active in our in our, in in the Christian faith today. Let's take a look. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm going to use Christianity as an example, but then I'm also going to use an example from our from uh, our political world. Some within the Christian faith view the Bible as the inerrant, never-changing, uh, timeless Word of God, the depository of all truth, uh, uh, no matter when it comes to not just spiritual truth, but in terms of what it says about science and other other um, uh, worlds of knowledge. Others in the Christian tradition believe that the Bible is, and, and the truths that you find there are ever-changing, ever-growing. It's a living, breathing kind of text. And that there's still, and, it, and, and the truths that are contained therein are still applicable for us in the world today if we understand it within its historical context, but it still lives and breathes for us as followers of Jesus and as Christian believers. Think about that in, 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 uh, as, it, as it's played out in, in our court system. There are ju judges and justices, we call them originalists, who believe that the Constitution, if it's, if it's there, it's law. If it's not, it's not. You know, there, it, it, if it was present in you know, the 18th century, otherwise... Otherwise, we don't deal with it. So if you don't find it in the Constitution, literally, in the literal words, then the Constitution is silent on it. On the other hand, there are those judges and justices who see the, the, the Constitution as living and breathing document that is open to interpretation and growth. And so we find, we find expanded meaning 
in its language that maybe wasn't present at the time because these people were living 200 and something years ago. But the truths therein continue to grow and, and uh, 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 yeah, it continue to grow. And, and so it's not, it's not a surprise, right, that the originalists are for the most part in, in, in state courts and appellate courts and federal courts and in the Supreme Court, virtually all of the originalists are rather conservative theologically. Because it's the same, I mean, it's a very similar perspective on what truth is about and what these, and how they, how they interpret documents, historical documents that they believe are somehow inspired. So that would be an example, an example. Hi. Yeah, I've, uh, I was impressed with uh, the explosion of creativity that you talk about starting at about 1200 to 800 and some. What were, what, what were some of the roots or the societal thing? Was it that they were no longer nomads? Was it that they were developing commerce uh, or, you know, and, or I guess I'm very curious what kind of forces were at work. And secondly, you were saying we're the one writer thinks we're in an age like that right now. What forces might there be now that might be causing us to be heading toward a new era? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I, I may probably should have made this clear, but you ask a wonderful question. Agriculture, settling, as you mentioned, right? Settling, um, the development of a male priestly class. You mentioned commerce. It's not just commerce of, of products and goods, right? It's the exchange of ideas as people traveled between states. Um, and as people moved from smaller tribes, as I mentioned at the end, this, this crisis of individuation, we can't overestimate how important that was you know, the move from tribes where your whole identity is, is, is measured by you as a member of that tribe. And now you're living next to, working next to, worshiping next to. Your life is among people from many other tribes. You now are, you now have to face that you are a unique I, a unique self. So settlements. But uh, uh, the exchange of ideas uh, with, with the increased trade, but also urbanization, urbanization. And I'll, I'll just say anthropologists are not of one mind uh, whether urbanization and its effects caused a growth in the neocort, you know, growth in the brain, or whether something happened, this growth in the neocortex at the same time as urbanization took place or whether there was a cause and effect relationship that took place, but both are happening. And this idea of personhood of self, a turning inward uh, uh, rather than upward um, that uh, that's all happening at this time. And the second axial age, we're really going to talk about that next week. And then where does that lead? What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? We're still navigating that one. We're still navigating that one. Remember, this took, you know, this first axial age was 50,000 to about 200 BCE. And so that, you know, that really, it took that long for hominids to become homo sapiens, to become homo sapiens sapiens. Hominids to become the knowing human, to become the self-reflective human. And now, what do we become next time that's that well, that's what we're going to talk about next time what's the next what's the next homo what into which we're going to evolve and what are the forces what are the forces at work 
that are that are pushing us to evolve even further. That's and and that one's. I mean that. I'm looking forward to your answers next week. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. You were talking about um, that part of us that causes us to not just be interested in truth, but packaging it and making it ours as opposed to anybody else's. And I'm wondering what you think of my hypothesis that that is born in our attempt to deal with shame. Say more about that because I, I, I I'm I'm I think I'm a brother in that, but I want you to teach me a little bit more. Um, I can't remember even the title or the author right now, but I read a very significant book about the, the subject of shame and uh, shame as opposed to guilt. Now, um, and um, it seems to be a topic that even in the psychological community, nobody wants to keep talking about it. Um, we we. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to face it, but we experience it. And there's a lot of things that trigger our shame. But one of the things that can make us feel like we've got a handle on it is if we know we're right. Yeah. What is it? What is it in? Gosh, that just is. Does I mean? What, doesn't that just give us a whole lot to think about? I mean, uh, what is it in us? What is in? Have you ever had an argument? I, I, we don't know each other, do we? But have you ever had an argument with your significant other and you find yourself arguing about, at the end, arguing about something that the argument didn't start out with being argued about? I mean, do you know what I'm trying to say? That probably has never happened to you. It's happened to me like every day. <laughs> but uh, um, what is it about us that just needs to be right? You know, that it, we hang our identity, our, you know, we, we hang our identity on what we believe to be true. And so that has a whole host of maladies ex associated with it, right? The, uh, 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 the lack of the ability to be, become vulnerable, for example, or to ask for forgiveness or uh, a whole host of, and, and and then think about it this way too, in terms of toxic masculinity. I mean, just in terms of uh, um, warmongering, you know, uh, 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 and, and and not and not seeking every possible source of mediation to conflict before we grab a hold of our phallic missiles and bullets and uh, uh, enter into the fray. The other thing I'd say about shame, and I, I know I'm not answering your question very well, but the other thing I say about shame is, you know, the more I've studied all this stuff, and I've studied all, all the traditions, I've taught courses on Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, but the, and, and then, of course, the, the origins of religion, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. The more I've studied all this, the more the, the the truth of the first chapters of Genesis have been borne out. Because our mythical ancestors, right, Adam and Eve, what is it that they experience in the garden? They experience shame. And as I read that, I'm not I'm not reading Adam and Eve experience. I'm I'm reading. What does this tell me? What is this? What is the psychological truth? that's born out in Michael Spath when Michael Spath experiences shame. You know? And so if you read, if you read these early chapters metaphorically, rather than trying to, you know, put the date on, you know, creation or when the ark was, or, you know, going down to Kentucky to the ark museum or, you know, whatever. But, but if, if you read it metaphorically, mythologically, and by the way, when I use the word myth, I always told my students, myths are always true. They just might not be fact. The reason that they're myths is because they're true. Myths are origin stories. They're, they're stories that 
teach us about our identity and about what we value and, and, and what life means for us, what life means to us. It may not be fact, but they're certainly true. And so the Genesis stories, I, I, I have a, a renewed, great appreciation for these early Hebrew myths in Genesis because they're so darn true. Uh, at least they're true about Michael Spath. You know, my desire to my desire to know. I never talk about. I'm, I'm off on a tangent here. I know some of you. I never talk about the fall into sin. I always talk about the fall into maturity. Because just like a little child, you can't keep a little child a little child forever. You just can't. They gotta grow up. You can't keep human beings children forever. What, what the Genesis story is saying is if people are going to become mature, you got to eat the apple. Right. Talk about, so it's talking about the desire to know, the desire to, to grasp the universe, right? So it's a fall into maturity. Anyway, that was, that was, that was a freebie. You didn't ask about that, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, thank you for that. I, I, and, you, and I know I didn't answer your question very well, but you've given me a lot to think about, and I appreciate that. I, I might take you somewhere slightly different. Please. Since you brought up... Get me off the hook. Since you brought up the evolution of our species, uh, and we, we all know that there were many other hominid species uh, that never, never made it... Uh, past evolutionary dead ends uh um i was i was struck by the your comment that the religions developed with re, with in a, as a response to the violence that was was uh becoming essentially becoming more violent because of the technology of the iron age um and uh just curious if you've given thought to the the fact of Darwinian evolution guiding us as a species or, or taking us as a species. Uh, and the fact that it seems like religions are somehow teaching us to, uh, to watch out for those that are not fit for, to the, to the weak members of society. And how does that relate the development of religion to the biological evolution of our species. Boy, that's a really that that strikes right at the heart of what we were talking about tonight. <clears throat> what we're what we're learning, and you know, I'm kind of out of my field a little bit here, but what we're learning from our uh, uh, anthropologist friends is that built into hominid DNA are two, I don't know if they're contrasting, but they're two parallel forces, energies. One is competition, because we, so the survival instinct. And one is cooperation. And so Darwin, right, it's not the uh, survival of the fittest. It's the survival of the most adaptive. And so both of these, both of these forces are within us. Which which one? As I said before, which you know we're we're not animals. I mean we are animals, but but we we're more than animals, right? So which which we can choose. And there are religious faiths, right? Let's say it this way, because I don't want to, I don't want to point fingers at full faiths. In every tradition, in every religion, there are parts of that religious tradition that feed exclusivity, intolerance, violence, even even using the language of love and all the rest but i mean they're they 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 feed right that uh violence and hatred and prejudice and all the rest in each one of the religious traditions 
and in each one of the religions, and each one of the and, and fear. And we know we know religious leaders and political leaders who just live and breathe that kind of story. Talking about the big story before, right? The stories that we tell. We're going to talk about this next week. I mean, that's that's the subject of next week. Which stories are we going to tell? On the other hand, there are others that that feed the life affirming, life giving, inclusive, compassionate um, uh, energies within the human species. So, and you know, and and let, let's let's face it. In, in all of this, by the way, religions aren't really good at this, and especially uh, theologians. <laughs> um, but what it really takes, right, for all of us, is a, a real a real need for humility. That that we're still seekers, and that we and that. We're we're a part of this together, and and um, in September I'm leading a trip to South Africa with a friend of mine who is a real dear friend of Desmond Tutu, Father Edwin Arison, a uh, an Anglican priest in South in Cape Town, and we had Edwin here. We flew him in from Cape Town for our Indiana Center for Middle East program in uh, last October, and Edwin talks about Desmond Tutu's philosophy. And if you know anything about South Africa and Desmond Tutu, his the philosophy is summarized in one word, right? It's called Ubuntu. I am because we are. I I exist only within a complex of other human beings. My identity is wrapped up in yours and ours together. And it strikes me that that's what we need to be feeding. This, 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 and these two opposing forces. I mean, survival is important. I mean, and and but those are our base needs, right? So it's important to be, to be, it's important to be fearful of certain things. I want my kids to not run out in the middle of the street. You know, my grandkids. And, you know, I want them to kind of have that have that fear. But I also, but that's not where I want them to live. It's important to survive, but then I want them to live, though, a much broader, broader kind of perspective. So these two parallel energies, the need for cooperation, the need for competition, both are, are present. Which one do we feed? I went on and on, but that that's sort of the survival of the most adaptive. That's That's how I think of Darwin. I want to push in a slightly different direction quickly. As you do. Yeah, right. Um, as I listened to you, I heard things developing in that axial age about community and about religious faith and so on. And I heard some common themes in each of those places. Why is it that we're not learning anything and we have chosen to use our wisdom to find out how I can destroy you rather than how can you and I work in spite of our piddly differences. Yeah, well. Give <laughs> you got three minutes to answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I mean, uh, we, talk, we talked about it a little bit tonight, but Don, all I can say is you're exactly right, and it's because we, we look at it this way. It's, it's easy pickings to look out there at people at at the other and to ask you know to to denigrate I'll, I'll just talk for myself to denigrate the religious or political right i mean heck that, i mean that that's easy pickings right that's low hanging fruit but the much more difficult thing and what religions need to be doing and when i preach sermons at various churches around town uh, in Fort Wayne and Bern and other places. Which, what we need to be doing as religious people is to be challenging ourselves to be our better selves. Where does aggression come from in Michael Spath? Where does selfishness come from in Michael Spath? What are the roots of exclusivity 
that I feel? Where do my what, what what's fear based inside of me? You know, and and then I can at least begin to understand how that's taking place in other people. You know, I it it's it's too easy. It seems to me to be projecting onto the other those very things that we don't want to deal with in ourselves. And that's, I think that's the role, that's one of the roles of religion. It, we need to be challenging those, what I call descending forces, those descending forces within ourselves. And then from that, learn, then we can project at least a little bit and try to understand that then in the other. I'm t I, I don't want to be othering others anymore. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> we, we invite you back next week to find out. We know where we came from. Where do we go? Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. It's really great to have you all here.